Hi there. Today I'll be reading The Romans of a Busy Broker by O. Henry. I don't know his full name. It's this. <laughs> um, picture confident, confidential clerk in the office of Harvey Maxwell, a broker, allowed a look of mild interest in surprise to visit his usually expressionless countenance when his employer briskly entered at half past nine in company with his young lady stenographer with a snappy good morning picture maxwell dashed at his desk as though he were intending to leap over it as though he were intending to leap over it over it i suck at reading um and then plunged into the grape heap of letters and telegrams waiting there for him the young lady had been maxwell's stenographer for a year she was beautiful in a way that was decidedly unstenographic. She went for when she forewent the pump pump of the alluring pompadour. She wore no chains, bracelets or lockets, bracelets or lockets. She had not the air of being about to accept an invitation to lunch on. Her dress was grey and plain, but it fit her figure with fidelity and discretion discretion. Nah. In her neat black turban hat was the gold green wing of a Macau, 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 something cow like. No, it's a bird. <laughs> On this morning, she was softly and shyly radiant. Her eyes were dreamily bright, her cheeks genuinely peach blow, her expression a happy one, tinged with reminiscence. Pitcher, still mildly curious, noticed the difference in her ways in this morning. Instead of going straight into the adjoining room, where her desk was, she lingered, slightly irres irresolute, in the outer office. Once she moved over by Maxwell's desk, near enough for him to be aware of her presence, the machine sitting at the desk was no longer a man. It was a busy New York broker. Moved by puzzling wheels and uncoiling springs. Well, what is it? Anything? Asked Maxwell Hart sharply. His open mail lay blank, lay like a blank of stage. Lay like a bank of stage snow on his crowded desk. His keen grey eye, impersonal and brisk, flashed upon her half impatiently. Nothing, answered the stenographer, moving away from, with a little smile. Mr. Pitcher, she said to the confidential clerk, did Mr. Maxwell say anything yesterday about engaging an another stenographer? He did, answered the pitcher. Answered Pitcher. He told me to get another one. I notified the agency yesterday afternoon to send over a few samples this morning. It's 9.45 o'clock. O'clock. And not a single picture, hat or piece of pineapple chewing gun has showed up yet. I will do the work as usual then, said the young lady. Until someone comes to fill up the comes to fill the place. Whoa. We're speaking hard, huh? And she went to a diet and she went to and she went to her desk at once and hung the black turban hat with a gold green macaw wing in its accustomed place. He who has been denied the spectacle of a busy Manhattan broken broker broker not broken broker he who has been, he who has been denied the spectacle of a busy Manhattan broker during a rush of business is handicapped for the profession of anthropo Apology. The poet sings of the crowded hours of glorious life. Speaking hard, huh? The broker's hour is not only crowded, but the minutes and seconds are hanging out all the straps and packing of both front and rear platforms. And this day was Harvey Maxwell's busy day. The ticker began to reel out jerkily. 
it's for fit its fitful coils to tape the desk telephone had a chronic attack of buzzing men began to throng into the office and call at him over the railing Giovanni, sharply viciously excitedly messenger boys ran in and out with messages and telegrams the clerks in the office jumped about like sailors during a storm even Pitcher's face relaxed into something resembling animation. On the exchange there were hurricanes and landslides of snow storm and snowstorms and glaciers and volcanoes. And those elemental disturbances were reproduced in miniature in the broken broker's office. In the broker's office. Reading hard, huh? I, I've said that like three times already. Maxwell shoved his chair against the wall and transacted business after the manner of a toe dancer. He jumped from thicker to phone, from thicker to phone, from desk to door, with the trained agility of a harlequin. In the midst of a disgrowing important stress, the broker became suddenly aware of a high rolled fringe of golden hair under a nodding canopy of velvet and ostrich tips. An imitation sealskin sack. And a string of beads as large as hickory nuts, ending near the floor with a silver heart. There was a self-possessed young lady connected with these accessories, and Pitcher was there to construe her. A lady from the stenof stenographer's agency to see about the precision, said Pitcher. Maxwell half turned half around with this with his hands full of paper and thicker tape. What position? he asked, with a frown. Position of the stenographer, said Pitcher. You told me yesterday to call them up and have one sent over this morning. You are losing your mind, Pitcher, said Maxwell. Why would I have given you such any any such instruction? Miss Leslie had given Miss Leslie has given perfect satisfaction during the year she has been here. The place is hers, as long as she chooses to retain it. There's no open place here, madam. Countermand that order with the agency, Pitcher. And don't bring any more of them in here. The silver heart left the office, left the office, swinging and banging itself independently against the office furniture as it indign indignantly, indignantly departed. I don't know how to pronounce that. Betcha seized the moment to remark to the bookkeeper that the old man seemed to get more absent-minded and forgetful of every day of the world. The rush and pace of business grew fiercer and faster. On the floor they were pounding half a dozen stocks in which most customers were heavy investors. Orders to buy, sell, buy and sell were coming and going as swift as the flight of swallows. Some of his own holdings were imperiled. And the man was working like a high gear, like some high gear, delicate, strong machine, string to full tension, going at full speed, accurate, never hesitating, with the proper word and decision, and act ready, and prompt as clockwork. Stocks and bonds, loans and mortgages, margins and securities. Here was a world of finance. And there was no room in it for the human world or the world of nature. When the luncheon hour, luncheon, that's a nice word. When the luncheon hour drew, drew near, there came a slight lull in the uproar. Maxwell stood by his desk with his hands full of telegrams, telegrams and memoranda. With a fountain pen over his right ear and his hair hanging in disorderly strings over his forehead. His window was open, for the beloved janitor's spring had opened it on the little on a little warmth had turned on a little warmth through the waking registers of the earth. And through the window came a wandering wandering perhaps the last odor, a delicate, sweet odor of lilac, that fixed the broker for a moment immovable. For this odor belonged to Miss Leslie, it was own and hers only. The odor brought her vividly, almost tangibly, tangibly before him. The world of finance dwindled suddenly to a speck, and she was in the next room, twenty steps away. Steps. <sighs> By George, I'll do it now, 
said Maxwell, half aloud. I'll ask her now. I wonder I didn't do it. I didn't do it long ago. What? He dashed into the inner office with the haste of a short trying to cover. He charged upon the desk of the stenographer. She looked up at him with a smile. A soft pink crept over her cheek, and her eyes were kind of frank. Maxwell leaned one elbow on her desk. He still clutched fluttering papers with both hands, and the pen was above his ear. Miss Leslie, he began hurriedly, I have a b I have but a moment to spare. I want to say something in, in that moment. Will you be my wife? They typed it wrong. They said, will you be my wife? Oop. I haven't had the time to make you make lo love to you in the ordinary way, but I really do love you. Talk quick, please. Those fellows are clubbing the stuffing out of the Union Pacific. Oh, what are you talking about? Proclaimed the long young lady. The long young lady? No, just the young lady. She rose to her feet and gazed upon him, round-eyed. Don't you understand? Said Maxwell, restively. I want you to marry me. I love you, said Miss Leslie. I wanted to tell you, and I snatched a minute when things had slackened up a bit. They're calling you for the phone now. Tell them what to wait a minute, picture, won't you, Miss Leslie? I, I didn't... I, I, I need a space here. Tell them to wait a minute, picture. Won't you, Miss Leslie? That was better. The stenographer acted very queerly. At first she seemed overcome with amazement, then tears flo flowed from her wandering eyes. Then she smiled suddenly through them, and on was it not? And on one of her arms slid tenderly on the about the broker's neck. I know now, she said softly. It's this old business that has driven everything else out of your head for for the time. I was frightened at first. Don't you remember, Harvey? We were married last evening at 8 o'clock, in a little church around the corner. <gasps> oh, that's awesome. So basically, it's a good story. I give it like a um, 8 out of 10. Uh, he was so busy with work that he literally forgot that he already married the love of his, love of his life. But it's kind of cute though. It's not, but it is kind of cute. Y'all get what I mean, right? <laughs>